Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning or good afternoon, as the case may be. My name is David Donoghue. Uh, on behalf of the Institute of International and European Affairs, I'd like to welcome you all to today's lecture by Peter Sands, who is the Executive Director of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria. We're delighted to be joined by Peter, who will speak to us today on the subject of enhancing global health preparedness for the future. This forms part of the Institute's Development Matters series, which is supported by Irish Aid, the Irish government's uh, development cooperation program. Mr. Sands will speak to us for about 20 minutes, uh, and we will then go to Q&A with our audience. Both his presentation and the Q&A are on the record. You can find the Q&A function on the Zoom at the bottom uh, of your screen. And, Please feel free to uh, send in questions whenever they occur to you uh, during the event. Please also feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle uh, at IIEA. We're also live streaming today's discussion. So, so a very warm welcome to all of you who are joining on uh, or via YouTube. I'd now like to give the floor to uh, Michael Gaffey, Ireland's ambassador to the UN in Geneva and a former director general of Irish Aid, uh, Michael will introduce our speaker, Peter Sands. Michael, over to you. Thank you very much, <clears throat> David, and good afternoon, everybody from uh, Geneva. I am really delighted to be here to introduce Peter Sands, director of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria. And it's, it's a real honour for me because in my current role here in Geneva and my previous role with Irish Aid, I'm very familiar with Ireland's firm commitment to the Global Fund in good times and in bad. And more importantly, I suppose, uh, of the impact that the Fund has had on the lives of some of the most vulnerable people on the planet. Uh, I would want to highlight Peter Sands' leadership as Executive Director of the Fund since March 2018. And I welcome the recent announcement of the approval of the extension of his term for a second four-year term from March 2022. He has brought his skills as an expert in global health and a leader in the financial sector to bear on the Global Fund. Uh, and by the way, I only realized in preparing, preparing for this that his distinguished career began after Oxford in the FCO, which he then left uh, for McKinsey. Uh, he led as, as executive director, he led to great effect the historic sixth replenishment in 2019, which generated $14 billion in pledges for the three-year funding cycle. This was a huge effort, which owes a lot to Peter himself. It was an effort of encouragement and of pressure, whatever it took, but it was very effective. So thank you to the IIEA for hosting this webinar as part of the Development Matters series. Um, as many of you will all be aware, Ireland was a founding member of the Global Fund in 2002, and we're very proud of our partnership since that time. And we're proud also to be increasing our support to the fund, pledging in 2019 uh, an increase of at least 50%, 50 to 50 million euros over the period 2021 to 23. Ireland plays a full and active part in the governance of the Global Fund through our membership of the 0.7 constituency, jointly the fund's fourth largest uh, donor. And later this month, Ireland will take our turn as the board member, an opportunity we are really looking forward to at a time of challenge and very real need. So it's clear to all that the world has learned the centrality of global health to global development over the past unexpected and dramatic year. And we're still learning. Since its foundation, the fund has proven itself to be one of the most effective organizations in global health. It is saving lives, preventing disease and suffering and strengthening health systems in some of the poorest countries. The purpose of the fund, of course, is to accelerate the end of AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria. And that was never an easy task. And the COVID pandemic has made it more challenging, disrupting health systems and threatening progress. But the eradication of these epidemics remain critical goals, and there has been real success in the effort. For instance, since 2002, AIDS-related deaths have fallen by 61%, new infections down 41%. Before COVID, TB was the world's uh, leading infectious disease, focused on poor and marginalized communities. 
And in countries where the global fund is investing, the death rate was down 20% on 2002. And malaria saw a 60% fall in death rates since 2000. So these are remarkable figures. But all of this progress has been threatened by what the fund itself has described as a perfect storm of economic, health and social crises as a result of the COVID pandemic. So with the next replenishment less than two years away, the fund is at a critical juncture. juncture. But there is no argument but that we need the fund in our global health architecture. Also, however, that we need to reevaluate that architecture in the light of the experience of the pandemic and its impact. How the fund positions itself in the years ahead is going to be critical. And that is why Ireland has been so invested in your ongoing strategy development process, helping to tease out the list of current and future priorities. So today we will hear about enhancing global health preparedness, looking forward to the challenges that we will face in the future and considering the actions we can take now to prevent or mitigate these. And there are few, if any, better place to speak on this than Peter Sands. Before taking up his current leadership role in the Global Fund, he chaired the International Working Group on Financing Pandemic Preparedness at the World Bank and chaired the US Commission on a Global Health Risk Framework for the Future. His work has looked at the security dimensions of health and the importance of investing in health security. Well, it's clear the pandemic arrived and hopefully the world is now catching up with this work. And we look forward now to an open and frank engagement on the challenges ahead. And I'll give the floor over to Peter. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And also thank you, David and the IIEA for inviting me to um, share some thoughts uh, today. I'd also like to start with a big thank you uh, to Ireland. Uh, as you said, Michael, Ireland has been deeply involved in the Global Fund from the start, from 2002, um, and has consistently stepped up uh, it, it, your support of the Global Fund, most recently at the Sixth Replenishment, as you mentioned. We face, uh, as you say, a perfect storm right now. And before I talk about the future, I think it's important to reflect on um, where we are now and why it is that the Global Fund, as an institution set up to fight HIV, AIDS, TB and malaria, is now so deeply involved in supporting countries in their responses to COVID-19. This time last year, or actually a bit earlier, um, we were um, wrestling with how we were going to help um, countries that were reeling from the first impacts of the uh, pandemic. And we, on top of roughly speaking, 4 billion or so that we invest every year in the fight against HIV, TB and malaria, we mobilized another billion dollars during the course of 2020 to help countries with three things. First was what we might call pure COVID responses, things like diagnostics, treatments, PPE, and so on, things that countries needed to respond to the pandemic. And remember, this was before any vaccines were available. Second was actions to mitigate the impact on HIV, TB, and malaria because we saw these services, vital life-saving services being disrupted across all sorts of different countries. And then third, countries needed to do urgent fixes to their health systems, whether it's supply chains or lab networks or so on, to be able to both preserve and sustain their HIV, TB and malaria services and to respond to the new pandemic. We moved very swiftly to deploy that money. Um, the first tranche of $500 million was all deployed by the end of July. The second tranche of another 500 million was all deployed by the end of December. We have now launched a second phase of our COVID uh, response mechanism. We call it C19RM um, with um, an initial funding of about $3.7 billion. So on top of the 4 billion, over 4 billion, we will be um, investing this year on HIV, TB and malaria. We'll be investing another $3.7 billion-ish um, to support countries in their COVID 
responses. Just to be clear what we do and what we don't do. We don't do the vaccine side of the response. That is organizations like Gavi and CEPI and UNICEF through COVAX. But countries have immense needs beyond uh, the vaccine side of it, whether it's testing, oxygen, treatments, um, the actual underlying health systems, the supply chains, lab networks, uh, and so on. And perhaps the most unglamorous, but one of the more uh, essential things is PPE. Uh, if, uh, every health system is dependent on having health workers. And if health workers aren't protected, they get ill. Tragically, the, the uh, mortality rate among health workers um, in many low and middle income countries is uh, roughly speaking about 10 times as high as the general population. So protecting health workers is absolutely uh, uh, essential. The Global Fund hasn't been doing this in isolation. We are um, a founder, a participant and member of the ACT Accelerator, which is a combination of uh, global health agencies, WHO, Gavi, CEPI, FIND, UNICEF, World Bank, who came together uh, last April um, and have, we, just, we essentially meet, the principles of the organizations meet uh, every single week um, and to ensure that we are working together in as coordinated um, and collaborative um, way that we can. And as part of the ACT Accelerator, we um, were part of the original investment case, which has now been revised and developed some $14 billion, including money to the Global Fund was raised. And now we have an outstanding gap, um, and, uh, a funding need of about $19 billion to drive the next phase of the global COVID response. A couple of observations um, I'd make. First is that while it feels in many of the richer countries in the world where vaccine rollout has um, proceeded quite fast, that you know the light is at the end of the tunnel, um, people are talking about uh, relaxing lockdown restrictions and so on. We are <laughs> looked at from a global perspective, uh, infection rates from COVID are higher than they've ever been. Uh, we have a, a catastrophe happening um, in India um, and we have extreme vulnerability from a lot of the neighboring countries whose capabilities to respond should they, should they experience the same um, epidemiological trends as India um, are not as strong as India's. Um, and so the Global Fund is very engaged with India and with India. Um, uh, neighboring countries or countries that are likely to, um, because of their trade and human contact with India, likely to see the same variants um, uh, communicated rapidly. We're trying to ensure um, that those countries, in a sense, get ahead of the curve um, in preparing for a potential next phase. So we are not through this at all. Um, we, as a world, we still have an immense challenge on our hands. Essentially, we're fighting with a virus that is evolving quite rapidly. And the pace of viral evolution is a function of global prevalence. So we have a massive shared incentive, all of us, in getting global infection rates down everywhere. Um, because that'll slow the rate of viral evolution and mean there are less variants that are undermining the tools that are keeping um, protecting all of us. This means that we can't just take a vaccine strategy. Accelerated deployment of vaccines is absolutely vital, but we're not going to get vaccines out to coverage levels high enough in most of the world and um, fast enough to reduce infections materially. Um, if we want to reduce infections materially in the short term, we've got to help countries with public health measures, with PPE, with testing, with all the things that many of us have become familiar with over the course of the last um, 12 months. 
that will then, in a sense, buy time until we can get um, vaccine coverage um, to greater levels in all the world. But we need that broader um, comprehensive strategy. The other point I'd make before looking to the future is uh, we all see, and you look on Google, the um, uh, infection rates and death rates around the world, and it's very sobering um, uh, from COVID-19. What people may not realize though, is that actually in the poorest countries in the world, in the very poorest countries, it's not the direct impact of COVID-19 that will be killing people. Um, it's the indirect impact. It's the knock-on impact on other diseases such as HIV, TB, and malaria. In the very poorest countries in the world, countries like Chad, Niger, Mali, in the Sahel region of Africa, it's almost, it's highly likely that the incremental deaths from malaria will exceed the direct death toll from COVID-19 because of the knock-on impact on a health system where the underlying malaria burden is very high. And although globally TB kills less people than COVID-19, in lower middle income countries, TB kills more people than COVID-19. And the, the, the impact of, we ran a, a survey um, last summer of some um, 500 facilities, healthcare facilities across Africa and Asia. And um, some of the numbers were, were dramatic with HIV testing down by 41%, um, TB referrals, i.e. the first step in diagnosis and treatment down by 59%, malaria diagnosis down by 31%, antenatal care visits down by 43%. You get a sense of huge pressure of the health system and massive disruption of other diseases. And so that's why we are taking an approach. Our mandate is to end the epidemics of HIV, TB, and malaria. But our view is we are not gonna achieve that while COVID-19 is rampaging, killing people, disrupting health systems. So we have to help countries do both. We have to help countries fight COVID-19 and continue to sustain progress and recapture some of the ground loss on HIV, TB, and malaria. And these really aren't separate tasks in any case, because it's the same healthcare workers, it's the same laboratory networks, it's the same supply chains that you use to fight an endemic epidemic and a new pandemic. So turning now to the question of how we enhance global health preparedness for the future. In some ways, my comments just now should have laid, I hope, um, the ground for that. Because the first point I would be making is that pandemic preparedness is not something completely separate or different from what you do to fight other major infectious diseases. Most low and middle income countries' responses to this pandemic have been based on the infrastructure and capabilities put in place to fight HIV, TB, and malaria. And when you think about the next pandemic, a lot of the capabilities and infrastructure will be that which we have invested in for fighting COVID-19. So we need to think about the new threats, not as something totally separate or discrete, but something that is linked to inextricably entwined with the way we're fighting the infectious diseases that are there now. That's true both from a practical perspective, because it's the same, it's the same kit, it's the same people, it's the same infrastructure that you're using. But it's also true, I would argue, from a moral perspective, because actually the world has had a rather unfortunate history of uh, recategorizing or somewhat losing interest in pandemics when they stop killing people in rich countries. So the last big pandemic to hit mankind, humanity, um, was HIV AIDS. 
Um, and HIV AIDS has killed over 30 million people um, since it appeared really in the sort of early 80s. Um, and it still kills well over 700,000 people a year, but very few of those are in the rich countries of the world. But it is a pandemic where the fight is unfinished, where we haven't actually finished the job. Roll back in history to TB. It wasn't actually that long ago where in countries like Ireland or the UK, TB was the biggest killer. If you go back to the end of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century, TB would have been the biggest killer. In places like Japan, it was until the 50s um, the biggest killer. But TB has largely been eradicated as or eliminated technically as a, a pandemic in the richest countries of the world, but is still killing one and a half, 1.6 million people a year um, worldwide. Again, we've sort of taken the focus off it, maybe thought of it more as a longer term development health issue and not so much as a pandemic. I think one of the most important things we need to do right now as we think about future health preparedness is say we're not going to do the same with COVID. We can't leave the fight unfinished. We can't have a situation where people in the rich countries all get vaccinated and feel like they're restored, coming back to normality, but actually COVID-19 is still killing millions of people in the poorer parts of the world. We need to have an approach to health preparedness for the future that truly leaves no one behind, that doesn't, in a sense, move on to the next threat until it's finished the job with the current threats. And so my view is that our approach to pandemic preparedness should be one that, in a sense, encompasses the pandemics we haven't yet finished the fight against, as well as the pandemics that might be around the corner. There are a lot of things we need to do collectively to make our work against and our protections against pandemics uh, better. We need better disease surveillance so that we understand where new pathogens are emerging. And they are emerging all the time. This is not, although, the, although it may feel like this is a one in sort of a hundred year event or something like that, actually, potential pandemics are emerging really quite frequently every year. Uh, you may recall we had Zika, um, the peak year of deaths from um, uh, HIV AIDS was only 2005, not that long ago. That's two and a half million people died of HIV AIDS in, in 2005. So these things are happening all the time. We need better disease surveillance, both of the animal and human health, because a lot of these threats are what they call zoonotic. They cross the, the animal-human barrier. Um, and uh, disease surveillance has to be everything from the simple reporting of what um, health workers are seeing through to genomic surveillance and sequencing so you can understand variants and viral evolution. We also need to ensure that some of the critical technology platforms that we've seen deliver fantastic results actually in COVID-19 um, are A, used for other sorts of pathogen, but B, made scaled up so that they're more widely available, so that we don't have a situation where so much of the world isn't able to get access to the latest um, tools. And the most obvious example of that would be mRNA, the platform for things like the Pfizer and Moderna um, vaccines. But there are other scientific platforms where we need to do that. We need to help the poorest countries in the world um, build their um, capabilities in actually delivering such tools. It's not enough just to buy them. You've got to be able to actually deliver a test trace isolate strategy or a clinical care pathway. Um, just having the drug or the test isn't enough to constitute a proper response. Preparedness and financing preparedness is the best way. People talk about response financing, but actually 
the best response financing is better preparedness um, financing. The, the final point I'll make is the critical challenge with preparedness financing um, and uh, giving us a, a global health system that, that makes all of us safer is, is sustainability. Um, we have a long history of um, having a flurry of activity after every um, pandemic or potential pandemic. We saw this with Ebola, we saw this with H1N1, we saw it with HIV, of um, policymakers and the media and everybody getting very interested in this for a short while, and then attention moves on to other things, the money dries up, and these things aren't, the, the preparedness spending isn't sustained. And in a way, it's kind of understandable because if you're investing in something where the uh, metric of success is that nothing happens, um, it's kind of hard to keep people interested. Um, it's, it's not a great, you know, if you're a politician, it's not a great achievement to say, you know, we invested all this money and nothing happened and that's a good thing, right? That's just a difficult um, uh, uh, challenge. So we need to create stronger incentives um, for um, how we sustain this spending. Um, there are a number of ways we can do this, but um, just to uh, offer a couple. One is um, the IMF does regular risk assessments of economies. Um, it doesn't include health risks in those assessments. If it included um, health risks in those assessments in a more structured way, it would be a way of um, introducing what we know are very real economic risks into the conversation between the IMF and finance ministers in a way that doesn't happen. And it would be a way of, in a sense, exposing those countries that aren't actually doing what they need to do, because we all have an interest in every country um, investing in preparedness. The a second way is to um, improve our preparedness in ways that deliver immediate benefits. Uh, now, I'm very interested in this because it, it, it um, accords with uh, the mission of the Global Fund. But if you want to make, in a sense, rural Africa more prepared and more able to detect and respond to new pathogens, new viruses, new bacteria and things, the best way of doing that, frankly, is to step up the fight against malaria. If we had a more systematic, assertive approach to getting rid of malaria, we would be building all the systems that um, you need to contend with new pathogens, but you would be doing it in a way that, in a sense, saved lives along the way and delivers benefits along the way. And I think if we're smart and we essentially use the fight against COVID, HIV, TB, and malaria, as a mechanism to strengthen our preparedness for the next pathogens that might threaten us, then we will, in a sense, be creating ongoing benefits in terms of saved lives um, that will create the ongoing incentives to sustain the effort. So I think there is an opportunity to make the world much, much safer from, from future threats but it's one that we have to do, we have to sort of take appreciating the synergies and the linkages with the threats we face today. And this is very real right now in the G7 and so on. There are people moving on to talk about future pandemic preparedness, which kind of risks running which kind of risks sending the wrong message to those in India and other places who are deeply threatened by um, uh, the current pandemic. We need to ensure that we both commit to helping everyone in the world get through this current pandemic and then lift our performance against all the deadliest infectious diseases, including those around the corner. So, we have a big challenge ahead of us. We have been knocked off course on HIV, TB, and malaria, the three biggest infectious diseases measured in terms of deaths before COVID came along. 
COVID itself is still at record levels of uh, infection, and we have a huge challenge in, in beating that. I think we have proven that scientifically we can do things that we didn't think uh, were possible. Uh, what we now have to do as a world is show that we can we can actually deliver on that promise, not just for those of us lucky enough to live in the richer parts of the world, but for everyone. Because ultimately, the, the line that no one is safe until everyone is safe, it sounds like rhetoric, but actually in the world of infectious diseases, it's an epidemiological fact. The way we make everybody safe is by making everybody safe. Thanks, I'll stop there. Peter, thank you very, very much. That was a fascinating and, and, and thought-provoking presentation. You make a, a very compelling practical case for treating these two phenomena, if I can talk of them as two phenomena, as interconnected. In other words, the immediate mandate that you have in the Global Fund and then the current global threats relating to COVID-19. And you demonstrate very clearly how they are interconnected and in, the, in fact, inseparable from each other. It's also a moral case that you make uh, about the, the saving of lives uh, in, in the process as, we, as you try to build uh, stronger health systems. I was struck by something which uh, Samantha Power was quoted as saying uh, in, at her swearing in event yesterday, I think, to become head, the new head of USAID. She mentioned two or three um, key challenges which USAID is facing, but one of them was other vaccinations and immunizations. And I thought that was that was important that she was making she she had it as really one of the two or three. Uh, implied top challenges for USAID. So clearly, your advocacy is working in, 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 I'm sure, many areas. But could you, could I just ask, Peter, how are you finding it? Um, are you finding it easy to get this rather complex message across that the two phenomena are interconnected and have to be, in effect, treated as a continuum. I mean, th those are those are my words, but how are you finding the advocacy end of it with international, with gov governments, uh, donors, um, IFIs, and so on? It, it's got its challenges, I, I have to say. Um, uh, one of, the, I, would, I would say, I would highlight two particular challenges. Um, one is that, um, in the response to COVID, um, it's quite difficult to get um, donors and stakeholders to focus on anything other than vaccines. Um, and while vaccines are incredibly important, and I, you know, ultimately they're um, the right answer. Um, if you look at a situation like India right now, um, uh, what's needed immediately to save lives of those with severe cases of COVID is oxygen. And what's needed to stop transmission is um, testing PPE and public health measures, social distancing and so on. They're just, the vaccine rollout will not be fast enough um, uh, to um, arrest um, what's happening. And so we need, we need a comprehensive approach. So that's, that's one challenge is that there isn't a silver bullet in um, fighting a, a sort of formidable um, virus like um, COVID. Uh, you need to use all the tools you've got. Uh, the second challenge, um, uh, and there's a lesson to be learned for people like me um, from this, is that um, it's difficult to get people as excited or focused on problems when you don't have the data. Uh, we can all go on Google and see how many people got infected or died um, from COVID-19, sort of any country in the world, any day. And the numbers may not be completely accurate and they're not completely accurate, um, uh, but you can at least get that. And it kind of mobilizes attention. You can see the trends. Um, India, for example, has the world's largest TB burden. Um, 
I know that TB services have been massively disrupted by what's happening with COVID right now, and that will result in hundreds of thousands more deaths. Um, but it's hard to, what we don't have is the same data capture and display that allows us to say, do you quite realize how much is happening? And I think one of the lessons we, we need to draw from the COVID experience is that having that data is incredibly powerful. Um, um, and that I, you know, the conversation we could be having about what's happening to the, on the knock-on impact on TB would be very different if I could tell you how many people got infected, how many people died of TB yesterday. Um, because more people will be dying of TB in India right now than, than COVID, I suspect. Um, but I, I don't know that for a fact. So data is very powerful and not having it um, is, a, is, a, is a real disadvantage from an advocacy and communication point of view. Yes, indeed, but I can, I can echo that. And you provide a number of uh, uh, indications in your presentation, which, which are, you know, which, which uh, are quite striking, namely how, how many people are, in fact, uh, how many more are dying in certain poor countries from the likes of malaria than, than COVID. And, and you need more and more of that kind of data to, to, to underpin your message. I, I can see that. Could I ask, um, as it were, in the period before COVID-19, were you finding it easy uh, or otherwise to, in, to persuade governments um, uh, in particular to provide funding for health, for the strengthening of health systems? So if you like, even before COVID came along, how was the Global Fund doing? You, you, you mentioned the, the, sort of the macro figures that you've been able to um, uh, attract, but I noticed that you would have a ninth, in relation to COVID, you would now have a, a 19 billion requirement for the next phase. Um, what is the overall willingness on the part of governments and other donors to devote significant resources to health, if I can put it like that? Sorry, I put myself on mute. Um, well, uh, the Global Fund um, uh, has had extraordinary support from uh, donors. And uh, in 2019, before COVID struck in October, uh, we had a replenishment that was to raise money for the next three years of our operation. And we raised a record $14 uh, billion. And um, as was mentioned, um, Ireland increased its pledge very significantly to 50 million uh, euros as part of um, that. So there was there is undoubtedly um, strong commitment from the richer countries in the world on global health. And indeed, we were seeing that um, implementer countries, the countries we were supporting, were increasing um, their own commitments. That said, I think what COVID-19 has demonstrated is that we were all underestimating um, the downside from allowing infectious diseases to really um, impact our societies um, and economies, and that actually we need to be investing more in health, more in um, protecting people from these threats, because the downside um, is so enormous. And indeed, even before I joined the Global Fund, when I was at um, uh, I was at Harvard for a couple of years, um, I wrote a couple of papers on exactly this kind of um, issue. Um, uh, frustratingly, I, I think I had very little impact <laughs> on persuading people. Um, uh, but uh, I'm hoping that COVID-19 has proved a rather, perhaps a rather brutal lesson on the economic downsides of not investing enough um, in uh, being able to detect and respond to uh, infectious disease threats. Um, I think part of the problem though is that we tend to think of this as aid and aid has natural limits um, to it. And it is true that Irish aid and you know, USAID and um, FCDO in the UK and others um, support institutions like the Global Fund. But we should also be thinking about this in terms of our own human and economic security um, because that's what COVID-19 has put at risk. 
Um, this is something that has affected all of us um, very directly. The IMF did um, a bit of analysis in which they showed that the difference between um, ending the COVID crisis quickly and ending it on a slightly slower trajectory was worth $9 trillion to the global economy. Uh, to put it another way, if invest, if closing the act accelerators investment gap of $19 billion brought forward the resumption of global economic activity by one day, it would have paid for itself. Um, uh, the very high return um, on investment here. Right. Peter, that last question came, in fact, from Breda Gahan. Uh, I now have a question from um, Dennis Nocton, who is a member of our parliament uh, and former minister. Uh, can Peter elaborate on the need to address shortages in testing capacity and PPE and so on in the developing world? Uh, as we vaccinate our own populations, uh, some of this will become surplus in the developed world. How can we best meet this or address this paradox? Well, Would you like to see that? it's a very good question. And um, uh, in a sense, that's exactly what um, the Global Fund is, is doing right now, is um, supporting countries with the testing, PPE, oxygen, um, and so on. Um, and actually, if you looked at the ACT Accelerator funding gaps, um, these are where the biggest gaps are. It's actually been much easier to raise money for the vaccine side of it and much harder to raise money um, for the other elements of the response. The only thing I would say, though, is what we are, <laughs> we're not seeing rich countries do less testing or use less PPE as they roll out vaccines. In fact, what we're seeing is testing going up and use of PPE going up. Um, and I don't say that as a criticism. Actually, it makes sense to be, um, we, particularly with the emergence of variants, um, we want to be testing um, at relatively high rates so that we understand and anticipate whether any of the variants are evading the vaccines. Um, and also, um, I think one of the things we've learned as a global health community is we underestimated the importance of PPE. PPE is incredibly, it's, it's arguably been the tool that has prevented most infections um, uh, um, of any of the ones we've used so far. Um, what's different though is this time last year, um, that we were very constrained on manufacturing capacity for both tests and PPE, and it was very difficult to get any um, for the developing world. Now manufacturing capacity has expanded um, significantly. So we're not constrained by that. We're more constrained um, by money, essentially. And, and the, I would stress the absolute importance of PPE because healthcare, you know, you, one could talk about healthcare systems, but ultimately a healthcare system is based on people and on trained health workers. And if you, if you lose those trained health workers, you don't have a health care system. You can't deploy vaccines. You can't make oxygen instruments work none of it none of it works um so ppe is absolutely vital thank you peter a couple of questions here which are linked in a sense one uh, is from uh, uh Quain, who's a researcher with the institute uh, could you share your thoughts peter on initiatives uh, to catalog zoonotic diseases such as the global virome project how feasible is it to identify and shortlist the next disease X, as it were. And then there's a question from Bill Emmett, who's a former editor of The Economist uh, uh, and chair of Trinity College's Long Room Hub. Many thanks, Peter, for the important work you're doing. I wonder if you could say more about what we rich countries can do to improve surveillance systems against new pathogens. I mean, you, you touched on that a bit, Peter. Um, should one priority be a network of labs for genomic surveillance and analysis and what political obstacles might stand in the way of that? Uh, both great questions. I'll take them in reverse order if I may. Um, first, um, Bill, on the um, uh, idea of sort of improving surveillance systems, um, absolutely we need to. And part of how we build greater preparedness for the future is going to be um, 
ensuring that in, across every country we have um, better disease surveillance. But we can't just think in terms of genomic sequencing. Genomic sequencing is the apex of a broader um, surveillance pyramid, so to speak, um, which starts with community health workers with a, with a, a tablet um, noting down what frequency of what types of um, infection or disease they're seeing and being able to upload that so you can see patterns um, emerging. If you simply have genomic sequencing on its own, you have, it's really difficult to know what to do about it because um, you, you can't link it to any information on what the actual epidemiological impact of a variant is. It's, a, <laughs> the UK is one of the countries with the most sophisticated and um, far reaching genomic surveillance, but the, the, the Kent variant, the B1117, the UK variant, was actually first identified not by um, genomic sequencing, it was identified by people in a, doctors in a particular area um, seeing patterns of disease they didn't understand. What they then did is they got genomic sequencing to help identify what, what was going on. Um, but I think it's a good example of the fact that you want to link classic epidemiological surveillance by frontline health workers through the, um, the, the pyramid of surveillance all the way to genomic se sequencing. The other issue, a very basic issue, is genomic sequencing operates off um, test samples done through molecular diagnosis. Um, I am seeing proposals now to um, uh, sort of fund genomic sequencing in parts of the world where there is so little molecular diagnosis happening is there won't be any samples to be sequenced. Um, so you, you have to kind of get your run before you walk before you run type um, uh, thing right here. The other issue um, is that um, uh, sequences have value, right? They provide input into what the vaccine should be or what the diagnostics and um, therapeutics are. And there is an issue about countries providing valuable information and then feeling like they don't get anything back, right? So if, if, if sequence, if information on variants is provided by low and middle income countries, um, surely they have some um, right to having some of the products, uh, some of the tools that are developed on the basis of that um, information. So I think there's a, there's a really, there is a political and equity issue underlying the development of sequencing. And we've already seen that in the influenza world with the pandemic influenza protocol and the Nagoya um, agreements, which were exactly addressing this issue in the influenza world. Um, you also mentioned malaria, and I, I wanted to give malaria as an example in rural, but you could, in, 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 in dense urban areas of um, low middle income countries, um, TB would be um, the kind of vehicle by which um, you, could, you could build um, stronger pandemic um, preparedness. Um, on the question um, about, um, uh, I'm just trying to remember what, what the, the, the global uh, viral project. Um, the global viral project, right. Um, look, there are a lot of people who know much more about um, uh, zoonotic disease and zoonotic transmission um, uh, than me. Um, what I would say is, I think it's, I think it is simultaneously very good to have initiatives like the Global Viral Project so we understand more um, the kinds of threats that could make the um, zoonotic transition. But we should never assume that we know where the next disease X is going to come from. Um, we should always assume that there's going to be something that we hadn't thought of um, that comes from um, the blue. Um, the, the other thing I would say, though, is that when you look at WHO's categorization of um, major disease threats, most of them are linked to things we knew already. 
I mean, we, we knew coronaviruses um, were a threat. We, we shouldn't have been, I actually ran a workshop when I was at Harvard um, in 2016 based on a scenario around um, a more transmissible SARS type coronavirus um, emerging in China. Um, um, so, you know, and I don't think I was being particularly insightful. It was a, it was a known risk um, in a similar way um, you know, influenzas are, uh, are um, you can, we know because of the 18, 1918, 1920 uh, influenza, we know that influenzas um, can be um, devastating. Um, so I think we need simultaneously to be making sure we understand the risks around the diseases that are all too familiar. Uh, another example I would give would be um, drug-resistant TB. Um, uh, TB has a very high prevalence in the world. Um, um, a lot more people have latent TB than actually fall ill with TB. Um, if we saw new types of drug-resistant TB, that could be pretty scary. Um, so we need to know those. Are. We need to understand through things like the Global Virome Project, threats that can cross the animal-human barrier. And we also just need to always have the sort of humility to accept that something might turn up that we just had never thought of. Um, uh, uh, so I, I, I don't think we can afford to sort of place all our bets in, in one place. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, obviously, Africa is uh, a key part of the world in terms of uh, the challenge to, to, to strengthen uh, health systems and increase resilience. What, a question from Breda Gann, what role has, has the African Union uh, been able to play so far in terms of encouraging investment in, in, in health? Actually, um, I think the African Union is um, one of the institutions that has actually had a good crisis. Um, uh, the African Union um, through Africa CDC um, has um, been very active in um, supporting uh, individual African countries in responding to um, the COVID threat. And actually, most African countries were very quick um, to uh, respond, um, partly, I think, leveraging their experience with infectious diseases. Um, and their capabilities, the infrastructure around testing and so on, and the ability to mobilize uh, communities. Um, they also created a thing called the Africa Medical Supplies Platform, um, which was a new mechanism uh, to enable African countries to, in a sense, pull purchasing capacity. Um, and we've been working with and are very supportive um, uh, of that. Um, and so, the Africa, African Union, I think, has been um, playing a really important role uh, in the continent's response. It's also played an important role uh, around vaccines um, and is supporting the development of uh, local manufacturing capacity around PPE diagnostics and so on. And so um, it's, it's, as I say, if I was looking around and saying, you know, which what, what was an example of a, uh, an institution that actually responded well to the crisis. I think the African Union and African CDC would be pretty high up that list. That's very interesting, Peter. Could, could I ask a quick question myself about uh, the Global Fund uh, itself as, as a vehicle for achieving change, uh, as, as, a, as a funding mechanism, but in particular as, as a partnership? In the context of this of the Sustainable Development Goals, we've put a lot of weight on partnerships worldwide, uh, sort of multi-stakeholder coalitions, as the means of, of 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 driving change. Do you think that the Global Fund itself is is a model for a kind of combination of government, civil society, private sector? Do you do you think it works? Uh, it, it is often mentioned as as an example of a, a partnership which can help to deliver the sustain the SDGs. What, what are your own reflections on that? I, I do think it works. Uh, I, I must admit, as somebody who's coming in from the private sector into the global health world, um, I was a bit um, 
I was a bit bemused by the complexity of um, the governance structures of um, the, the Global Fund when I first arrived. And it wasn't at all clear to me that it, that it would work um, uh, because we have civil society, private sector, implementing governments, donor governments. Um, uh, and um, and it also we work with a, um, a whole array of um, different technical and partners like UNAIDS or WHO or, or World Bank Malaria or Stop TB. Um, and um, it, is, it can be complicated, um, but actually um, it is very effective. Um, and what I think we managed to demonstrate over the last year or so is we can also move um, very fast if needs be. Um, the Global Fund was, um, uh, if not the fastest, arguably one of the fastest multilaterals to actually put uh, in a sense, cash on the ground um, in, in a way that could um, help countries um, respond to the crisis. We move very um, swiftly. So it's, you know, like every organization, we have our um, areas we need to work on and develop and improve and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, but um, actually, I think it is a very interesting model of um, how different aspects of society um, can come together to achieve a goal. Peter, perhaps one final question, if I may. Uh, there's been talk about a global health treaty, um, you know, to, to strengthen that the One Health approach. Uh, do, do, do you think that is viable? It's a, it's a good question. And um, I, I, I have to confess, I'm, I'm not sure I know um, uh, the answer. Um, if, if a health treaty is um, useful as a catalyst for getting the world to have a common vision around things like equitable access to um, vaccines, diagnostics and treatments and the equitable sharing of sequencing data and so on, then I think that's a really valuable um, thing. If, on the other hand, it ends up becoming something where all the energy goes into negotiating the treaty, but we don't actually do the things that we need to do to make people safer, um, then um, uh, th that I'm not in favor of. Because <laughs> um, ultimately, the, the, the test of whether a treaty is going to help is, is not whether it's a fine bit of Legal ease that everybody sort of stands in front of a bunch of flags and signs. It's is does it actually um, uh, make a difference in in the way we combat infectious diseases, um, and and that's where I I I would like to believe it's going to be helpful. I'm a little worried that it might just kind of absorb a lot of um, yeah. uh, diplomatic energy. Um, yeah. um, uh, but you and the ambassador are probably better placed to answer that question um, than I am. Peter, thank you very, very much for, first of all, giving us your time. Secondly, a, a very fascinating and, and uh, thoughtful uh, sort of tour, tour d'horizon. Uh, I think we've come to the end of our time, unfortunately, um, but you were very generous in responding to the various questions and in giving such a strong and, and uh, uh, memorable presentation. I mean, I will take away in particular the, uh, your strong message about the interconnection between um, fighting uh, COVID-19, perceived to be the, the short-term global challenge, and the uh, inseparable challenges relating to uh, TB, malaria, and uh, HIV AIDS. Um, I, we wish you every success in your ongoing advocacy um, in, 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 on all fronts, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm I don't speak for Irish aid, but on the other hand, I would make a, a, a guess that we will, uh, that you can count on Irish support uh, uh, going forward. Um, thank you very much, Peter, for giving us your time. We look forward to seeing you again at some point, either physically or online. And, uh, and, and, and thank you for, for your contribution today. Thank you, David, and thank you to the Ambassador and also to the IAEA. Thank you.